Bird Shanty, and today in Homemade Science, I want to share an example of something called a siren disc. Now, this is a classic physics demonstration, and it's an excellent example of how frequency affects a pitch. I have several examples here from very, very simple to a little bit more complex, but nothing that's too hard. So let's get started. The original siren disc was developed by Thomas Seebeck around 1841 as a means of studying pure tones in sound. The demonstration has been modernized over the years, and a typical device used by universities may look something like this. Now the ones I want to show you today are much simpler than that. They're either made from CDs, or they're made from a foam plate, or this one was made from the cardboard from a cereal box. Now in closer examination, we see that all these discs have holes in them, and those holes will actually match up to concentric circles. Now we know that sound travels as a compressional wave, and a compressional wave is caused by some type of vibration or disturbance. In this case, the compressional wave forms every time the airstream passes through one of the holes. You notice that the pitch changed as it went from one row to the next. That's because this outermost ring has 18 holes in it, the middle row has 15 holes in it, and the inner row has 12. So the more disturbances for every turn of the wheel, the higher the pitch. Now if I can direct air through all three of those rings at once, I'll get a triad. Now there's a second way I can change the pitch if I keep the airstream on the same row and simply change the speed of the wheel. So let's see what that sounds like. Now that you've seen the operation, let's take a look at what's needed. First of all, the air source could be as simple as blowing through a straw, or another possibility is to fill up a balloon and then use a hose to direct the air source. Now next up, of course, we have to get the wheel spinning. Uh, something like this is uh, not going to work well it's too loud. I found it could be as simple as gluing a motor onto a battery. All it took was a little bit of hot glue. There it is. This one's a little bit nicer. It has a handle to hold on to. Now on this last piece, I mounted the motor on a base, and I also made a simple rheostat for it, and that's going to allow me to control the speed of the motor. Now here's the setup for it. Our motor, of course, is going to get the disc on it. Like that. And this is a pencil that has a graphite exposed. And graphite's not a good conductor, so I can vary the speed by either attaching the alligator clips directly, which would be full speed, or if I vary it down the length of the pencil, I can lower the speed simply by increasing the distance between the two. Down to about there, and we see how slow the wheel's turning. Now I think the most interesting thing was trying different numbers and designs of holes on the discs. I found the CDs could hold a maximum of five concentric circles. I'll start with these two discs. They both have the same number of rows and the same number of holes. First we'll try it where the holes are evenly spaced apart. The outer row should be an octave higher than the inner row. On this disc, I made the whole placement random. I think we can pretty much describe this one as noise. But what actually surprised me is that it didn't matter where I was on this, it pretty much sounded the same. Now let's go on and try another one. Here we have two sets of eight holes, one towards the center while one's towards the outside. Now let's see if it makes a difference.
So it appears that the location of the ring doesn't make a difference. As long as it's the same number of holes and they're evenly spaced, we'll still get the same pitch because they're rotating at the same rate. Now let's go on and test this wheel, which has different sized holes. Now it's always interesting making discoveries in the middle of a video. I just made this wheel about five minutes ago, so I wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, obviously it doesn't change the pitch, but it does change how loud it appears. And that makes sense. Larger holes would allow more air to pass through, which means a bigger compressional wave. The second thing I found is that the airstream from the balloon pump actually works better than blowing through the straw or the balloon itself. I wish I had known this at the beginning of the video. Now let's go on and test some additional wheels. I found this design listed as a chord or interval, which means it's a combination of two notes. This disc was fashioned after a design I found online. I think I'm missing the point of this one. As I move the airstream around, it still sounds the same. If anyone knows the purpose of this design, I would love to hear about it. Now that we've seen discs made out of CDs, let's take a look at some other materials. For example, this one was made out of a foam plate. And finally, this last disc is made out of the cardboard from a cereal box. Well, considering how flimsy this piece was, I actually thought it worked fairly well. Now, we'll be doing a follow-up video on how to build these, and at the same time, a little bit more research into the history of this piece and its importance in this study of sound. In the meantime, I want to thank you for watching and come back and see me again. Okay, bye.